Welcome to the Building Great Lives podcast, a podcast about real life, real issues, and finding real answers to life's most difficult questions. And now your host, Trent Gillum. Greetings, everyone. Trent here. Welcome to episode number 16 of the podcast. I'm glad you've joined the Building Great Lives journey. Before we get started, as always, I would like to say a huge thank you to our monthly ministry partners and, of course, you, the listener. You make this ministry possible. And I'm excited to have you on the Building Great Lives team here at the Building Great Lives podcast. It's our desire to help people from around the world grow, heal, discover, and fulfill their unique purpose. Thank you so much for sharing these episodes. We pray that these messages of hope reach every possible person in every possible nation. And I'm excited for today's episode. We are going to be talking about something that is very important to me, something that I have preached about, taught about for many years. And I believe that it is key to overcoming our struggles. Today's episode, we're going to discuss being completely open and honest with God. It's not as easy as it sounds. There's something very powerful about being completely open and honest with God. Remember, God already knows our thoughts as well as our faults. He already knows the things that we're thinking. He already knows what's in our heart. And we must remember that he came to help those that are in need of a physician. He did not come for those that think they're whole. He come for those that have need of him. And the Bible even says in the book of Romans that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now think about that for just a moment. He died to deliver us. That means he came and died and rose again for the worst part of us. He did not come for the best of us. He came for the worst part of us. That is an incredible thought to think the God of all glory, the God of all heaven, the God that created the heavens and the earth would manifest himself in the flesh, trade the glories of heaven to spend time upon the earth for not the best of me, Not the things that I do right, not the things that I get right, not the struggles that I don't have, not the trials that I don't face, but he literally came for the worst part of me. He came for my struggle. He came for the things that I don't know how to get through. He came for my failures. He came for my sins. He came for all of the times that I said, Lord, I'll never do that again, and certainly had great intentions, but then failed again. He did not come for the best of me. He came for the worst of me. What an incredible thought that no matter what you're dealing with right now, many times the enemy will tell us, well, you're dealing with these struggles and these trials and all of these things that you feel like you can't control. Where is God in all of this? He's simply waiting on us to be open and honest with him, to allow him to deal with the worst of us, to deal with the struggle that is within you. That is how powerful our God is. It amazes me because it seems completely opposite of human interaction because we as humans struggle to be honest with each other because we fear rejection. I want you to see the best of me. You want your friends, your family to see the best of you. We certainly don't want them to see the worst of us. And so as we interact with humans, we think that surely if our friends, our family, our neighbors, if they see the worst of us, they will reject us and they'll move on. And because of the fear of rejection that all of us have, We take what we feel in the natural and we often relate it into the spiritual and we treat God as if he's a person that is around us that will reject us if they find out that we have fears, if they find out that we have struggles. But let me assure you, listener, 
God is completely opposite of man. You have no reason to fear being rejected by God. Matter of fact, I assure you that man may reject you, but God will never reject you. God already knows your heart. God already knows your thoughts. God already knows your faults. And even though he knew your faults, he says, I love you so much that if you could learn to be open and honest, then there is something that happens in the spirit realm that changes everything in our lives. Because to really be open and honest with someone, we have to trust them. And we talk a lot about faith and having faith in God. Faith is trust in God. We need to look at faith not just as what we have when we say to the sick, be healed, but faith is a trust in God. God has proven himself trustworthy. He's faithful. The Bible even says that he's faithful to a thousand generations and beyond. And because God is faithful, he's proven himself trustworthy because he has proven that he came for the worst part of us. I can trust him to take care of me. You can trust him to take care of you. And so in that interaction of where faith begins to show itself as trust, instead of hiding our fears and hiding our weaknesses and hiding our struggles from a God that already knows that we have them, he's simply waiting on us to come to him with honesty and say, Lord, I struggle with this. Lord, I have questions about that. Lord, I wonder why that I had to go through this or why am I struggling with that? When we come to God with a true relationship of faith that is evolved and displays itself as trust, then we know that he will not reject us by our honesty but he will in fact help us because of our honesty. God is completely different than man. You don't have to worry about your failures pushing God away. When we are honest with God, he doesn't move away from us when we admit to him that we carry hurt or that we have failed or that even we have sinned. It doesn't push him away. He doesn't look at us and say, when you get it all together, I will come back and help you. God doesn't do that. Man may do that. Someone you've had a relationship in this earth may have done that. But it's time that you come to the revelation that God will not do that to you. Matter of fact, his word says that he will never leave us nor Will he forsake us? So we can come to him. The key to healing, the key to deliverance, the key to getting through your struggles and overcoming your failures is the trust and the revelation that when I am honest with him, he rewards my honesty by giving me all of the help that I need. My failures, my honesty, does not push him away, it actually draws him closer. Can you imagine that? How incredibly encouraging is that to know that your failures, your weakness, uh, all of your struggles, it's not pushing God away. We think too much in the natural. Because in the natural, when we have struggles with someone, it pushes them away. When we have struggles and we turn to God in the spiritual, it doesn't push God away. It draws God near. My honesty draws God closer to me. Your honesty draws God closer to you. And so you can go to him and say, Lord, I have to be completely open with you. I'm struggling with my thoughts. I'm struggling with my past. I'm struggling with my present. I'm struggling with the things that I've been through. And when you find the courage to be completely open and honest with God, even to the point that sometimes you have to tell God, God, I know you love me, but I don't understand why you allowed this to happen. The honesty 
It will not get God's rebuke. It will get God's help. It will move God closer. We find this to be biblically sound. This is not just something that I want to be true. It's something proven by the word of God. The Bible tells us a story in the book of Mark, chapter number 9, verse 17 through 27. There was a man that had a son that was possessed with a mute spirit. There were times that the spirit would tear at him, and he would foam at the mouth. And the King James says he he would gnash his teeth, and that word there means grind his teeth. He was pining away. This man, this father who has a great need and desire for his son to have this healing and deliverance, finds the courage to bring his son to the disciples, and they could not deliver him. The father had already built up his hope that if I bring him to the disciples, he'll be delivered. Maybe this time it will work. Maybe this will be the moment. No doubt he had tried many other things, but this time surely it will work. I've heard many powerful stories about Jesus and his disciples and all of the miracles, and surely this time it will work. But when the disciples could not deliver the child. Can you imagine the pain, the disappointment that the father must have felt? He must have thought, I had my hopes up so much that this time would be the time that I would be delivered. Have you ever felt that way? You ever got your hopes up and said, this time when I pray, it'll be the time, but then felt that overwhelming disappointment when you felt like it did not happen the moment that you thought it would. That's the way this father must have felt. But then when he brings the child to Jesus, the Bible said that the spirit began to tear at him and he fell on the ground and he wallowed foaming. And Jesus asked his father, how long is it since this spirit came upon this child? And Jesus, the father replied to Jesus, since he was just a child. And oftentimes it's cast him in the fire and it's cast him into the waters to destroy him, trying to kill him. If you can do anything, Jesus, please have compassion on us and help us. What a powerful prayer. If you can do anything, Lord, please have compassion on us and help us. And the Bible says that Jesus said unto him, if thou can believe, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. This had to be a very difficult moment where the emotions of the man and the hope of the man mingled with the disappointments of the past and even where the disciples could not heal. Now there is this tearing, this pulling, this nagging that says, I, I want to believe. And Jesus says, if you can believe, it's going to be possible. And this man, he cries out and says something incredible. He says, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. And we know that this must have been excruciating for the father because the Bible even says that the father cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. What an incredible moment where we get a glimpse of Jesus. Now I want to know this man has just responded Responded to Jesus out of the desperation of his spirit. And he says to him, not just with great faith of seeing miracles, but with anguish of disappointment. And he does not hide his feelings. He admits it. He's honest. Did you catch that? He's honest before God. And he says to Jesus, he says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I'm going to be honest with you. I I know that you've done miracles, but Lord, I've tried so many things and so many times I've left disappointed. I believe, but Lord, there's something inside of me also that is doubtful. I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. I want to know, what does Jesus do? How does Jesus respond to such honesty? 
How does Jesus respond to someone that is openly admitting to him, I know it's possible, but I don't know if it's possible for me. How is Jesus going to respond to such honesty, such openness? Because that is going to set the tone on how the Lord deals with people that are open and honest. Will Jesus rebuke him? Will Jesus tell him, no wonder your son has never been healed. You have doubt in your life. Will Jesus rebuke him and say, when all of the doubt is gone, come back to me and I will heal your son. Will Jesus look at him and say, this is the reason your son is still sick. You have doubt in your life. Is that how Jesus will respond? I want to know because it's going to show me how the Lord will respond to me when I am open and when I am honest. This story, how the Lord will respond to this man's honesty, this cry of desperate honesty is going to be very revealing on how God will respond to you when you are open and honest. Should this man have hidden his discouragement? Should this man have hidden his unbelief? Should he have concealed it? No. Jesus already knew the man's heart. And so he's open and he's honest. How will Jesus respond? Do you know what's amazing? Jesus does not rebuke him. Jesus does not tell him, you're the problem. If you had enough faith, your child had not have gone through this. Jesus did not rebuke him and tell him, go away from me. You have doubt in your heart. When you get all the doubt out, come back, and then I will do great miracles for you. No, the Lord did not do any of that. The Lord simply looked at him, and in the midst of a man willing to be open and honestly ask for help, Jesus responds with compassion. And he looks at the child and rebukes the spirit and the child falls to the ground as if dead, the Bible says. And Jesus reached down and took the child by the hand and lifted him up and he was alive and delivered. Healing and deliverance came by the power of the Lord. Jesus did not rebuke the man for his honesty. Jesus reached down because of his honesty and gave the man a miracle. And that is how you can expect the Lord to respond to you. That is how I can expect the Lord to respond to me. What an incredible revelation that when I'm open and I'm honest and I say, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. He doesn't rebuke me. He doesn't walk away. He doesn't cast me aside, but he draws close to me and speaks a word of healing and deliverance. I'm talking to you, listener. You're trying your best to hide the pain from the Lord, but he already sees the hurt. It's time that we go to him with true openness and honesty because we have learned how he will respond to our honesty in action. Let's see how this honesty principle holds out throughout Scripture. Because there's got to be more times that when people were honest, the Lord did not reject them, but in fact drew close to them and healed them. Adam and Eve is a tremendous example from the very beginning. In Genesis 5 and 6, we know that Eve had ate of the tree and took it to her husband and he ate of the tree and their eyes were opened and they saw that they were naked and they hid themselves because they were ashamed. They sewed fig leaves together in an attempt to cover themselves and try to remove the shame that they were feeling. Genesis 5 and 8 then says that they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve had hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And then Genesis 5 and 9, the Lord called unto Adam and said, Adam, where art thou? Now, let's just get this settled right now. God knows everything. He's omniscient. And because of this, he already knew where Adam was at, but he is looking for Adam to be honest 
and for Adam to deal with where Adam is at because humanity's natural response to God when we fail or when we struggle is to hide ourselves because that's what we do to other people. We hide our struggle. We hide our failures. We don't want anybody to see the quote unquote real us. We don't want anybody to see the struggle, and so we only reveal the smile and the good side. Adam is doing that. The very first man is doing the very same thing that we still do today. He's hiding himself from the presence of the Lord, and the Lord says, Adam, where are you? Because God is saying, I need you to be honest. I need you to reveal what you're going through. And finally, fallen man after being questioned by God for the very first recorded time, finally Adam, with his honesty, cries out, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, and I hid myself. Adam's honesty didn't cause God to destroy them and start over. Adam's honesty did not drive God away. In fact, it did the exact opposite. Adam's honesty caused God to draw near to them and remove a man-made covering that could do nothing for them. The Lord took them from where they could not deliver themselves to covering them with the sacrifice representing the things to come. It all occurred because Adam was finally honest. Here I am, Lord. I hid myself because I didn't want you to see me in my shame. I only wanted you to see the good side of me, Lord. I hid myself. I didn't want you to know about or to see the bad side, the side that I know will disappoint you, the side that I know that is a failure, a mistake. I don't want you to see that side. But the Lord says, Adam, where art thou? And Adam opens himself to God and in his honesty declares, here I am, Lord. I was hiding myself because I was ashamed. The Lord did not reject him because of his honesty. Isn't that amazing? That's incredible. The response of Jesus to the man that cried out, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. We find that same characteristic of God. Dealing with Adam as he grants mercy and not destruction when Adam admits, here I am. What about Jacob? A person's name revealed their character. Jacob's name literally meant liar and deceiver. He was a manipulator. He learned it from his mother who taught him how to trick his father into getting his blessing away from Esau. And Genesis 32, 24 through 28 tells a powerful narrative of when Jacob is ready for change and he leaves his family on one side and he crosses the Ford Jabbok and there alone he wrestles with an angel of the Lord. And there Jacob told the angel, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And they wrestled all night. And the angel said, you've got to let me go for the day is coming. And Jacob would not let him go. And he said, I'm not letting you go unless you bless me. And the angel even reached down and broke Jacob's leg. The King James says that he disjointed the hollow of his thigh, leaving him to limp the rest of his life. Yet Jacob would not let go. He endured the pain of a broken leg. But then there was a pain that must have went deeper for the angel of the Lord did something that must have hurt him deep to his core. The angel asked, what is your name? Jacob must have thought, why do you want to know my name? My my name, he knows in his own mind, my name means liar. My name reveals my character. Why do you want to know my name? Ask me anything but that. And that moment must have stung deep inside of his soul. What is your name? As the angel of the Lord demands an honest reply from Jacob. Jacob, the liar and the manipulator, had to make a choice. Let go and never be changed or blessed or hold on and be open and honest. And it was in that moment that Jacob began to open up. And in honesty, he admitted, my name is Jacob. 
I want you to think about that. He was literally admitting my name is liar and my name is deceiver. He had to be honest with who he really was. I am Jacob, the one that is lied, the one that is deceived, the one that is manipulated. That must have been difficult when he was honest with the angel of the Lord. That's when real change came to Jacob. The angel of the Lord responded to Jacob's honesty and said, no longer will thou be called Jacob, but your name is going to be Israel. For as a prince, thou hast power with God and men. And I love the next part of that verse. It says, and thou hast prevailed. Honesty brought victory. Honesty brought an overcoming power. Jacob's reward for being honest with God was more than just a name change. It was a life change. And the same thing that happened with the man and his son that cried out in honesty. The same thing that happened with Adam and Eve when they cried out in honesty. The same thing that happens with Jacob as he cried out in honesty is what God desires for you when you learn to be honest with God. Honesty with God is key to overcoming your struggles. Honesty with God is key to overcoming your fears. Honesty with God is key to overcoming your despair. Honesty with God is key to overcoming your depressions. Honesty with God is key to overcoming anxieties. Honesty with God is key to overcoming heartache. Honesty with God is key to overcoming addictions. Honesty with God is key to overcoming affliction. Honesty brings results. Listener, you do not have to live in fear of God. When you learn to trust him and you know that he came to deliver the worst parts of us, then you know that he is one that will not run away, but our honesty will draw him closer. And I pray right now that you are feeling that touch of God that you're feeling, oh God, I've got to experience change. Listener, that only way that you truly experience change is when you learn to be open with the God that already knows your thoughts and your faults, but loves you anyway. And in your honesty, you will experience the deliverance that you need and the change that you desire. As has become our tradition, I want to pray for you, listener. Just as the lady with the issue of blood, when she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, the Bible says she looked at him and told him all the truth. She was open with him, honest with him. I pray right now that you find the strength to be honest with God. He will not reject you. He will draw close to you. He will help you. And I'm praying for you to have the strength right now in Jesus' name because honesty brings results. Honesty will change everything. The reward for being honest with God is that you experience the change that lasts a lifetime because relationship with God is about him delivering us from the worst parts of us. Thank you for listening. And in the meantime, please subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And if you have enjoyed this episode, please tell a friend, maybe text them the link or share it on your social. That would be a huge blessing to us. We want to get the word out all around the world. You can find me on social at Trent Gillum on Instagram at Rev Gillum, or you can reach me at Building Great Lives Podcast at gmail.com. And I look forward to hearing from you. And until next time, let's keep building. You've been listening to the Building Great Lives Podcast, a member of the Real Life Church Network. Join us next time as we dig deeper into life's most challenging questions. 